Kratom will be treated as a Schedule 1 drug beginning September 30th. As many of you know, I'm opposed to any drug being illegal, but it is rare that a temporary scheduling order has such significant and immediate negative effects. I'm going to discuss why banning the drug is a bad idea, and I'll also discuss some of the misinformation that has appeared on both the pro and anti-Kratom sides. Also, if you want to learn more about Kratom, I encourage you to view the overview video in the description. This move by the DEA was not really surprising. The FDA has been seizing shipments since 2014, there's been a rise in publicity and use, and there have been more reports of acute negative effects. Further, the drug had already been on the DEA's Drugs of Concern list, and some individual states had scheduled it. Having the DEA go further and schedule it for at least a couple years simply continues the authoritative actions we've already seen. With the temporary scheduling process, there are a couple important players to be aware of. First, the Attorney General has delegated their power in this area to the DEA. Second, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who the DEA must contact on these matters, has delegated their power to the Assistant Secretary of Health. In this case, the process went as follows. The DEA placed Kratom on its Drugs of Concern list. Other parts of the government, including the FDA, also expressed concerns about the drug. In May 2016, DEA Administrator Chuck Rosenberg contacted the Assistant Secretary about the DEA's plan to schedule mitragynine and 7-hydroxymitragynine. The Assistant Secretary responded later that month and said the HHS was fine with the scheduling, while also noting the FDA had confirmed there was no current medical use or applications for medical use. This led to the Notice of Intent on August 30th, which confirmed the DEA would temporarily schedule Kratom on September 30th. In order to avoid potential delays, the DEA decided to forgo a comment period that would have more formally dealt with concerns about the ban. I've seen a lot of people focus on the DEA's general reason for the scheduling, which is to prevent imminent hazard to public safety. I agree that's an entirely absurd statement, though it is worth noting that it's also a carbon copy of what the DEA generally uses for temporary scheduling, whether it's Kratom, synthetic cathinones, or U47700. Keep in mind, we're dealing with a massive and ardently pro prohibition agency that is defending its own existence. The DEA is not the place to turn for reasonable views about drugs. The DEA's reasoning for the prohibition largely comes down to operating in a business-as-usual manner. It identified another drug that does not have a current medical application, and there is a growing level of use. It also views nearly all of that use as either misuse or abuse. Just with those factors, it can pretty much justify, at least in the government's view of the world, a temporary scheduling. As for more specific reasons, the DEA cited increases in reports of acute harm, increases in imports and seizures, and some loosely connected fatalities. There were 660 calls to poison centers regarding kratom exposure between 2010 and 2015. Granted, there are more calls for acetaminophen and caffeine. There were also more seizures of kratom products during the first half of 2016 than at any prior point. The DEA says it recognizes there may be a medical use for it, but it is the agency's duty to at least temporarily place it in Schedule 1 until everything is sorted out. During that time, however, the government will hurt many people and further infringe on freedom. Since this is a temporary scheduling order, it lasts for two years and can be extended to three years. During this time, the authorities will further evaluate the drugs in question and see how they should be controlled. It could be removed from the controlled substances list, but the DEA seems to think it's more likely to be placed between schedules five and three. There are some almost laughable problems the DEA seems to have with Kratom. First, it is worried about the drug coming from unknown sources with an unknown purity, and yet it wants to push what is left of the market into the underground, which is bound to make things worse, just as it does for other drugs. There was also this fantastic quote, especially concerning, reports note users have turned to Kratom as a replacement for other opioids, such as heroin. In other words, implementing a harm reduction technique is apparently very concerning. And lastly, the DEA says there are numerous deaths associated with Kratom, which indicates the substance is a serious public health threat. Even if every allegedly Kratom-linked death was the result of Kratom, it still wouldn't be numerous. And of course, nearly every death has involved polydrug use. 
The initial response to the ban has included a petition with 130,000 signatures and a Dear Colleague letter from two congressmen, Mark Pecan and Matt Salmon. That letter has been passed around Congress in the hope that more people will encourage the DEA to delay the ban. These kinds of responses haven't changed anything so far, but the DEA did say it was surprised by the number of responses it received. Kratom does help people with opioid withdrawal, and for some people, it has been a useful replacement. In these cases, particularly if someone was previously using illicit opioids, it's hard to view the switch to Kratom as anything other than a significant harm reduction measure. That's not to say Kratom isn't itself a drug with its own potential safety issues, but it is still lower risk. Because of those properties, and the fact that it is clearly an effective pain reliever for some, there are many advocates supporting it, something you see for only a small number of drugs. Kratom emergency scheduling is therefore a bit unique. If you schedule a random synthetic cathinone, alpha PVP for example, you will probably just lead people to use another somewhat similar drug, and you will pretty much only be criminalizing recreational use. That's still wrong, but criminalizing medical use is even more disgusting. A significant portion of those who take Kratom do so in medical or minimally recreational settings. They're using it as a replacement or as a painkiller. In those cases, it ends up being like cannabis is for many people. At a time when opioid deaths are high and legalization cannot be obtained, we need every harm reduction tool we can get, and Kratom is one of those tools. I'm an advocate for maximum freedom and maximum individual responsibility. A freedom-centric country like what would be supported by current libertarians and those who promoted libertarian principles centuries ago cannot justify making drugs illegal. There are cases where the prohibition is particularly absurd, like with Kratom, but it is fundamentally wrong to inject the force of the state into someone's life for doing something with their own body. If you are truly in favor of small government and personal freedom, yet you support prohibition, you really aren't in favor of either. Instead, you are advocating for the existence of an authoritarian government that will enforce your ethical beliefs on the entire country. The freedoms held by both Americans and those in every other part of the world prevent any legitimate drug prohibition from existing. It's good that there's been a large movement against the Kratom ban, including in popular sources. It's unfortunate, however, that misinformation seems to creep in on both sides. One example of misinformation is with those who claim Kratom is not an opioid. Though, before getting into that, I'm clearly referring to some of the active drugs in the plant. This claim is all over the place. It's likely due to people having a false idea of what opioids are, and due to a misunderstanding of the harms associated with common opioids. Here are some examples of that problem. Now, even though it activates opioid receptors, it is not itself considered an opioid. However, the letter the DEA put out made it seem like the two components, the, the constituent components of this drug are somehow uh, opioids. It uh, binds to the same receptors as opioids, but it indeed is not an opioid. Kratom isn't even really like a drug. You don't really get high off of it. Kratom is a natural substance. It's a plant. It's actually in the same family as the coffee tree. What Kratom is not is an opiate. The same belief has appeared in print. Gizmodo says the active chemicals are not opioids, and Wired trumpeted the same idea. However, mitragynine and 7 hydroxymitragynine are opioids due to both their effects and mechanism of action. As for them not being opiates, well, that is true, but that's also true for oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, etc. I'm inclined to believe those saying opiate are really talking about opioids, in which case my primary point stands. Going back to the Wired piece, and this has actually appeared elsewhere, the claim is that Kratom is not an opioid, but instead contains alkaloids. Wired even states pharmacologists label Kratom as an alkaloid, not an opioid. Anyone with a slight understanding of this would see the problems with that statement. First, the sentence does not even make sense. Alkaloid deals largely with chemical structure and is generally used when discussing nitrogen-containing alkaline substances. Opioid is a pharmacological term rather than an organic chemistry term. That brings me to point number two, which is that morphine, one of the most important opioids in history, is an alkaloid. And just to fully deal with this point, let's see what else is in the alkaloid group. We have quinine, ephedrine, psilocin, nicotine, caffeine, and cocaine. Do you really want to put all of those in the same pharmacological group? Apparently, Discovery News thinks that actually is what alkaloid means, which is amazing. Mitragynine and 7-hydroxymitragynine. 
The first, mitragynine, is a psychoactive alkaloid, the component that gets into the brain and works similar to other alkaloids like morphine, ephedrine, quinine, and nicotine. The other issues I have with the reporting really come down to exaggerating the harms of other drugs and acting as though natural inherently means safer than synthetic. A post on the Libertarian Republic said, this intention, if enacted, would classify Kratom along other dangerous narcotics, such as heroin, LSD, MDMA, and GHB. First, narcotic is a bad descriptor. Two, they don't have to be dangerous or illegal. And three, LSD is likely safer than Kratom. There are also some sources that have claimed it's barely even a drug. Unless we go around redefining the word drug to exempt a huge section of substances, Kratom is a drug and it is clearly psychoactive. These people would often prefer to just call it an herb or a natural supplement, with that implicitly suggesting natural substances are safer than synthetic ones, which simply is not true. And then there are other prevalent issues like misunderstanding what Schedule 1 even means. For example, statements like the DEA now thinks Kratom is as dangerous as heroin are quite common. They're also not accurate. And as absurd as the DA may be, even their written description of Schedule 1 drugs doesn't act as though they are equally dangerous. Now that it is clear Kratom probably will be scheduled on September 30th, what are the possible results? On the research side, it'll be more difficult to gain approval and receive funding, and a lack of approved studies makes it less likely Kratom will be adequately shown to have a medical use. And yet, a DEA spokesperson stated he did not believe it would be Schedule 2, because that would be a drug that's highly addictive. Instead, it is at the point where it probably should be recognized as a medicine. Unfortunately, I have a hard time picturing Kratom recognized as a medicine in two to three years, especially with the new barriers to research. It would have been better to avoid emergency scheduling, wait for more research, and then move forward with an immediate permanent scheduling between five and three. That would still be terrible, but it would make more sense than what the DEA is doing. If it is approved and available, it may be more likely that synthesized kratom alkaloids, kratom-like drugs, or a standardized extract is the only thing on the market. Outside of eventually being rescheduled, it is possible Kratom could be removed from the controlled substances list before late 2018. This is not common, but it is possible. During the time that it is not legally available, Kratom may appear on darknet markets. It is not well suited, in my opinion, for sales in that sector, due to the bulky nature of the product, sourcing problems, and the existence of a relatively small market, but it may perhaps be available to some degree through those sites. For many people, the only real option will be to return to other drugs. In medical settings, this might mean taking prescription opioids, which you can definitely use safely. Though, for people who find Kratom is more effective, or they are more comfortable using it, it's terrible that they will have to switch. In non-medical settings, users could end up taking illicit market opioids. If even a small percentage of Kratom users go down that path, the government has effectively guaranteed there will be more deaths and harm than if Kratom had been left alone. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. In order for the drug classroom to provide more education, support is necessary, and the best way to support is through Patreon at patreon.com slash the drug classroom. You can also contribute through PayPal or Bitcoin. You can connect with me on Twitter at Seth A. Fitzgerald and via email at seth at the drug classroom.com.